Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today I brought a few friends along with me, our first ever live studio audience. <laughs> Many thanks to New York's Chelsea Factory for hosting us in this wonderful space. We've got a great show for you, certainly a show for you, a conversation with two of the most distinguished journalists in America. I promise you that is not an oxymoron. DC power couple, Susan Glasser and Peter Baker. She's a Washington columnist for The New Yorker. He's chief White House correspondent for The New York Times. And together, their topping bestseller list came out at number two with a bullet, a new book called The Divider. It's an incredibly detailed, at times, jaw-dropping look at the Trump presidency. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the upcoming U.S. midterms and the state of American democracy in 2022. How much longer do we all have? But first, who are the 2022 midterm elections about? I have options for you and the audience. We're gonna start with option A. The midterms are about Joe Biden. Thoughts? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Traditionally, they have been a referendum on the incumbent, that's true, the incumbent president and his party. It's always been a him, that may change over time. And if Republican House leader Kevin McCarthy has his way, the next month will be all about blaming an aging and out of touch president occasionally falls off his bicycle for the highest levels of inflation in 40 years and hordes of illegal immigrants swarming the southern border and even occasionally Martha's Vineyard. Joe Biden has launched an assault on the soul of America, on its people, on its laws, on its most sacred values. Unfortunately for McCarthy, the president is still riding high off what the Gen Zers would call his hot girl summer. <laughs> he has, with the passage of multiple pieces of landmark legislation over the past months, a popular executive order on student loan forgiveness, though it does have some detractors, not to mention falling gas prices until at least the Saudis had something to say about it, and a booming job market. And judging by his September 1st speech outside Philadelphia's Independence Hall, you remember, it's one that kind of like made him look really evil and malevolent, Biden is intent on making the midterms all about 45 and his most hardline supporters. Here he is. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. I promise you more than one option. Let's try a second option. Kick the tires on option B. The midterms are actually about Donald Trump. Oh, Manhattan audience, look at this Chelsea on a Friday night. It's true, it's true that the former president who is facing multiple criminal and civil investigations, some of which are even new, continue to promote lies about the 2020 election and defend those who violently assaulted the Capitol on January 6, 2021. Also true, however, that not all Republicans and not even all Trump supporters see it that way. Biden himself has acknowledged that. And surely, tarring one third of the US population, none of whom happen to be in this audience apparently, as being beyond redemption, does little to bridge our country's political divide. But hey, it is a strategy. Getting back to my original question though, maybe who is the wrong word? Maybe we should be asking what the midterm elections are about. Option C, the midterms are about the culture wars. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Everyone's saying, nah, it's Joe Biden. It's really Joe Biden. Well, well, the culture wars does include Roe versus Wade, right? Yes, yes it does. Start with a series of horrific shootings this spring and summer, put gun control front and center. That is until the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade and with it, nearly five decades of abortion law. That is a lot to digest. And don't forget a generational divide on gender rights and of course, MMA style PTA meetings. That's like cage fighting over critical race theory, whatever that is. Will that be enough to get voters out to the polls? Regardless of who or what the midterms are about this year, one thing is clear. The global stakes are plenty high. We wake up every morning to news of democracy under attack, whether it's Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine or China's tightening grip on Taiwan. And you better believe that as American voters are heading to the polls on November 8th, our allies and our adversaries alike will be watching closely to see how healthy our own democracy is. To talk about all of that and more, I'm joined today by the New York Times' Peter Baker, and the New Yorkers, Susan Glasser, they both live in Washington, D.C. How does that work? They're out with a new book on former President Trump called The Divider, and it's topping all the bestseller lists. Let's get 
right to it. Friends, Romans, divided countrymen, please help me in welcoming Susan Glasser and Peter Baker. So you wrote a book about Trump. Yeah. It's doing incredibly well. The audience doesn't want to hear more about Trump. <laughs> I keep hearing people saying they don't want to hear more about Trump. You're giving us more about Trump. Yeah. Do people not know what they want? Yeah. You know, I mean, have you ever been on a highway when the car crashes? Yeah. People say they don't want the traffic jam. Why do they stop the car and look at the accident? You know, this is like, I'm sorry, but you need to read about it. You need to understand what happened, yeah. right? When you started this book, and you said this in acknowledgments, well, that was very interesting, you were planning on actually leaving the United States to become foreign correspondents. And you chose not to when Trump was elected. It's that because the US felt like more of a foreign country to you at that point anyway? Well, Peter had been a White House correspondent going all the way back to Bill Clinton. And I think the concept was that if somebody's gonna be blowing up the White House, you probably want to have, if you're the New York Times, the person there who understands what's like normal crazy and what's crazy crazy in the White House. So, uh, so yeah, we moved back to Washington a few months after Peter and our son moved away from Washington. We had to get a whole new house. And so we got to be foreign correspondents in our hometown. And if you're being foreign correspondents, how are you, expl are you explaining the United States and the Trump White House to a whole bunch of readers that don't understand him. No, it's not that they don't like him, or but they don't relate to him. They literally think he's from another planet. Is that what you're basically saying? Well, I mean, he is from another planet in terms of Washington, right? He was like no other president we've ever had. And so that was the job. The job was to try to understand how different this White House was, as Susan says, not just the normal, okay, Republican, Democrat, but, you know, normal president versus not normal president. He fits in the not normal president category. And so it was important to find out what is going on there as best we can. Now, you say it's like a car crash, but I mean, to be fair, if you told me the car crash that I'm about to see is literally the same as the car crash I just saw a mile ago, I might speed up a little bit. This is a different book. <laughs> what is it that is particularly unusual new novel in like not 20 minutes that you're saying, no, he here's something, here's why our take together really matters on this really overcovered guy. Right, except that it's not. I mean, the truth is, is that there actually hasn't been uh, a an actual history of the four years of the Trump administration. And, you know, there's been a lot of great journalism all along the way. These are important, you know, moments. But if, you know, you, your kid or your grandkid 10 years from now is like, what the heck, Donald Trump was a president? You know, we really wanted to write a book that would put together and show that January 6th and the catastrophic ending of the Trump presidency in 2020, it was not some crazy outlier, you know, that you can just sort of look at what happened at the end, but that really you have to go back and look at all the four years to really understand. And then you see very clearly, by the way, that this was not some extreme bizarre event at the end, but a four year war on American institutions. Every presidency, you're gonna have a book like this that comes out that's a full history. That's gonna happen with any White House. The difference with Donald Trump is that this is a, as we put it in the introduction, an active crime scene, right? It's not just history. This is the present day of American politics and maybe even its future. So there's an urgency to it. And what we found is that actually in many examples like this, it's not just the clown show or the tweets. That can often be the public theater of the presidency that we saw so much. But when you go back and you look into it, many of the things that we didn't take seriously enough were real attacks, uh, like for example, pulling out of NATO. We were told by multiple officials, Trump was much more serious about this than I think the reporting on it contemporaneously had us to understand. He said it was obsolete. He said these people aren't paying. Why do we bother? What's, why is it worthwhile? But then of course, I thought one of the interesting things about NATO was it was the one time I remember Trump saying publicly that he was wrong about something. He initially uttered that it was obsolete. Then he said, well, yeah, but I, didn't, I was a real estate guy. I talked to my generals. The generals know more about the stuff, and they said it's not, and now I believe my generals. What, what was behind that? I remember when he said that. Yeah, well, because they were waging this war to basically keep him from blowing up the alliance. And I don't think he ever actually really changed his mind. Yeah, he didn't change his mind. I don't think, I think he still He did say that. He did say it. I think he, he said, still believes it was obsolete because he kept saying again and again to his staff, maybe we should just get out, let's just get out. And they kept saying, no, sir, let's not do that because it would, it would just destroy our uh, relationships with Europe. And that's actually kind of important to the United States. Imagine, of course, <laughs> if we had Putin invading Ukraine without the United States being part of NATO. What a difference that would make. So this, this brings me to two different sorts of points. The first is 
Biden becomes president, NATO today is considerably stronger than it was not only under Trump, but before Trump. Yeah. So does that mean to you that actually those four years of Trump presidency don't actually have the same impact that you might have thought they would have at the time that you were in the middle? Yeah, but now you need an invasion to make it go away? I mean, that's not exactly the right... Well, but even the perspective <laughs> on the United States yeah. once Biden came in, suddenly you saw those numbers uh, in the Pew surveys from all the European populations that had, like, sunk to these incredible post-war lows, and they just bounced right back up. Just felt like people were just ready to turn the page and move on. Do you feel that way? I mean, look, Ian, you work internationally with a lot of world leaders. What, what, what do they think about the word of the United States right now? They don't think it's very good, do they? The United States as a leader in the world, would you make a deal with the United States that was controversial and think that it was gonna stick forever or maybe just for the next two years? I think that the damage done to American credibility uh, when it comes to making deals is very, very serious. If he comes back or just generally? Just generally, because uh, the prospect that Republicans could take over Congress and even if it's not Trump, the party has been remade in his image in a way that I think would lend anyone to question if you had another international climate accord. Uh, you know, how much stock would you put in the United States' long-term willingness to commit to a course of action right now? As long as the U.S. remains this polarized and this divided, the greatest geopolitical crisis in the world is right in Washington. It's right in our midterm election. And I, I think that's going to be the case for the foreseeable future. The foreign policy crisis is not about NATO per se. It's about the United States and whether this superpower uh, can get its act together. And there's uh, you, no sign of that happening. You brought up midterms. I, I want to talk more about foreign policy, but I'll ask about midterms directly because we've just seen in the Washington Post um, that a significant yeah. majority of Republicans that are actually running uh, for office in the House are actually election deniers, or yeah. at least have said that publicly. What does that mean to you in how the Republican Party is potentially turning and what we're setting ourselves up for 2024, given, again, everything that you are spending your lives on right now? <laughs> Peter, I'll go to you. Well, it's all about Trump, right? It's about his dominance of the party. It's about currying favor with the king. They know that they can't say anything other than that because then they pay the price. And they, they know it because they've seen it happen, right? What happened to the 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach him over January 6th? Gone. Lost their primaries, were forced out, decided to leave out of frustration, what have you. And the rest of them saw what happened. So they all say they're going to, they agree with President Trump, former President Trump about the election, whether they do or not, because that's the price of admission. You don't get into the party unless you say that. So let me move on uh, to where we think Russia is going. And I say that because you wrote a book on Putin. And, you know, this is- We write is, all the fun characters. You do. Uh, <laughs> and, and I wonder at the time that you were writing that, because clearly, I mean, you know, we, your view of Trump has been fairly consistent over the course of the last four years. I'm wondering if your view of Putin has been very different over the course of the past, say, 15. I think it's been very consistent. If you go back, we were there for Putin's first term, first four years in office. Yeah. And I think if you look back, you see the thread, the through lines from when he was starting to today. Now, I don't think we would have necessarily said then he would invade other countries per se, but we knew that he was not some modernizer, not some westernizer the way a lot of people in Washington thought or hoped he was. That he was, in fact, a KGB guy who wanted to restore central power at the very least, if not the old borders of the Soviet Union. I think what you see today is very much the the logical outcome of what we saw for in those four years. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, you know, I think with both Putin and Trump, they're very different characters. But, uh, you know, a similar rule applies, which is when somebody tells you who they are, you should listen. And, you know, when we were in Russia preparing to come back to the United States, and this was early in, in Putin's tenure, what did he say? He said the breakup of the Soviet Union is the greatest geopolitical catastrophe, catastrophe of the 20th century, yeah, a, a century filled with more than its share of catastrophes. And this was an incredibly revealing moment. It suggested that he was unsatisfied with the post-Cold War peace, that he would do whatever he could, given his capacities at the time, to revise that, uh, what he saw as defeat for Russia and the Soviet Union. And he's, he's basically, that's what he's done. Now, right now, we are in an environment where people are getting increasingly concerned about where this is all heading. People ask me, what's the off-ramp? 
you even talk about an off-ramp, but you can talk about trying to stabilize the situation. We're not you know, even at that point yet. Honestly, I find this off-ramp phrasing to be completely triggering of me. You know, <laughs> I didn't every mean single, to do no, something. No, 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 no. But you know. it's not you. It's not you. But I did, how many apparently. Times, yeah. <laughs> Ian, how many times have you had U.S. government officials in the last 15 years talk to you with very, you know, great seriousness about, you know, the various off-ramp proposals that they were going to offer to Vladimir Putin to get him to stop invading Georgia, to get him to stop uh, annexing Crimea, to get him to stop intervening in Syria. Have you ever known Vladimir Putin to be a big fan of American-created off-ramps? No, not no, particularly. No, not no. Particularly, no. And I, my, a lot of people were focused on when Joe Biden said, you know, Armageddon, the thing that really worried me about Joe Biden's comments were that he used this phrase off ramp, because that suggests to me that he is thinking about uh, proposing something to Vladimir Putin that it's hard to imagine Vladimir Putin accepting. Biden saying that this is the most dangerous time, this is the closest we are to nuclear war. Mm. You know, nuclear war, yeah. I mean, something that really scared us when we were young. Yeah. We all remember the day after. Right. I had nightmares for months yes. after that, <laughs> since 1962. Yeah. I don't think most Americans, I think one of the reasons that Armageddon is a big deal is because most Americans <laughs> were not ready to be propelled back into that reality. Do you, do you think that's where we are right now? Well, I think you have to take it seriously, right? In other words, I don't, I, there's a lot of reason to believe that Putin is just blustering. He tends to talk about nuclear uh, weapons at times when he is weak, when he has had a setback of some sort. So it's his way of reestablishing dominance in a sort of Trumpian way in the international stage, pay attention to me, I'm strong, don't think I'm weak, doesn't mean he's necessarily preparing to do it. Intelligence people would tell you they haven't seen any signs of moving of assets or resources that would indicate that. But having said that, you can't assume that. You, what if you're wrong? What if that assumption is wrong? When somebody tells you, as Susan says, that they're thinking about using nuclear weapons, you ought to take that seriously. So that's when you hear a president say Armageddon. Yeah, it's alarmist language, but you, if you're not taking it seriously, then we're not doing it right. So if I want to take the two halves of this conversation and put them together, you were just talking about how former President Trump wanted to leave NATO. Um, and he probably won't have the same guardrails on him in terms of the kind of cabinet if he wins a second time around. If you're right and Trump is going to run and gets the nomination and is back on Twitter and back on Facebook, and that is the policy that he is driving, what happens? Well, I think you're right to suggest that the, the fraying of this uh, very bipartisan consensus in Washington around support for Ukraine is likely to occur. You know, Donald Trump has been a pretty vocal, considering actually how disastrous it's been for Russia. Donald Trump has been a pretty vocal pro-Putin, pro-Russia voice throughout the conflict. He has opposed the major aid packages. Briefly, for not for the Ukraine. beginning. Not at the beginning. He said, like, I don't know who this guy is. Yeah, but, but then he, he, came, but then he came right a back strategic off. genius. Yep. I mean, you know, it's very yep. hard to walk back strategic genius yep. on the eve of Putin invading Ukraine, yep. not a move of strategic genius. Uh, so it's pretty hard to walk that back. Uh, he's also been publicly on the record as opposing uh, the major aid packages that Congress has passed for Ukraine. And in fact, you know, he and Tucker Carlson are leading something really without much precedent in American politics, which is a pro-Putin uh, wing of the Republican Party. Uh, remember when the Republican Party was tough on Russia and, you know, it's, it's a pretty big transformation. It's a minority, but I think you're right that Trump back uh, as the nominee of the Republican Party back in the middle of our daily discussion, I have to say, like, the idea that we're going to be back to, like, writing stories about, like, in a series of early morning tweets, Donald Trump said blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, I'm not personally looking forward to that, I must say. Okay, so before we close, Peter, single thing that Trump accomplished over the course of his four years that most impressed you? Um... I will say this for him. He is the most transparent president we've had in modern times, which is to say that when he has motivations to do things that other presidents would never admit, he tends to admit it out loud. When he says he doesn't want a cruise boat with COVID patients to come to our shores because he doesn't want his numbers to go up, he is telling us what his real motivations is. When he tells, when he tells us that he wants the Justice Department to uh, prosecute his opponents and, and spare his friends, he's not pretending it's for any altruistic reason other than he th just wants his friends to be spared and his po opponents to be prosecuted. He, through four years, through Twitter and his statements and conversations with the press, 
you know, was as open about his motivations and uh, that we've ever seen. And it's remarkable because he told us all the ways he was trying to manipulate and intimidate and bend the institutions of American government to his political will to make them his instruments of political power, whether it be the military, the Justice Department, the intelligence agencies. So we didn't have to guess. We didn't have to sit there and say, well, you know, he says he wants to do it for this reason, but he really wants to do it for that reason because he always said he wanted to do it for that reason. So that's something that impressed him. Uh, that wasn't something he necessarily did that was impressive. Um, we, we've, there were certainly accomplishments over yeah, the course he, of the like penal reform. He launched an insurrection at the United States Capitol. That was an a unprecedented in American history, Ian. Yes, that yes. was something that never happened before. Not one that you thought was a good thing. It was impressive. Yes. It was impressive. It had made an impression He showed you. the yes. incredible weakness of our institutions. Uh, he showed that people were willing to go where no one thought they would follow a leaner, past the bounds of law and the Constitution. It, and one of the things he showed, I think, is that, you know, not just the sort of foreign policy world, but the policy world writ large, we tend to overstate the role of policy de debates in our politics. We tend to overstate the role of ideology in our politics. And, you know, the really interesting thing about a challenge coming from the president of the United States to principles of democracy is that it shows that, you know, these policy fights don't mean as much as we tend to think that they mean because we care about them. Susan Glasser, Peter Baker, thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And that's our show this week. Come back next week if you like what you see, or even if you don't, but you just want some more friends because we've got a live audience, and they'll be your friends. Why don't you take a moment, subscribe to our most excellent newsletter. It's called Signal.